scriptures. We're going to have our reading, and then we're going to come to God's word. We're going to read from Hebrews 7 and verse 20, and we're going to read through to chapter 8 and verse 1. I've always told you chapter 8 of Hebrews and verse 1 is the theme of the whole letter. So what's Hebrews all about? It's about Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. Well, let's read from verse 20 then. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not relent, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests, because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever as an unchangeable priesthood, therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the people. For this he did once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weaknesses. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Just pause on that verse for a moment. Just think of that. We've been looking at Galatians and the difference between the gospel and the law. And Can you see that there? The law, he says, as priests, men who have weaknesses, but the word of oath, the gospel, you see, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. What a contrast. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Amen. Amen. May God bless that word to us this morning as we come to it and as we examine it and look at it together. Let's come before God together. Let's pray. Let's seek his blessing upon this this message this morning. Let's ask him to to draw near to us and to, to be near us. Lord, we thank you that we're here this morning. We thank you that we're in your presence now. We come confidently, boldly even, because your word encourages and even invites us and commands us to come with great confidence and boldness into your presence. And we know that we can come not because of ourselves, not because of anything we have done or anything we are, Lord, but because of Jesus, our great high priest. We can come to that wonderful place, which is heaven. We can come confidently into your presence even this morning. What an amazing thing that is, Lord, to think about that just for a moment. Where are we now? What are we doing? We're coming into the presence of the angels in heaven. We're coming into the presence of all the just men and women made perfect, the souls of the saints in heaven. But most of all, we're coming into your presence, the living God, and we're coming to worship you now. And we're coming to have you commune with us as well as we call upon you. Lord, hear our prayers. Make this place a hallowed place. Make this house the gate of heaven, this tabernacle, this meeting with God. Come now, Lord. Come, even as we pray. Come upon us. Come in the midst of us. May we know that this is no ordinary meeting, that we're meeting with you, even meeting in heaven while we're here on earth. May heaven come down and touch us this morning. Forgive us all our sins, Lord. Forgive us all our trespasses. Forgive us for all that we are and all that we've said and done this past even 24 hours, let alone week. Now, now, blot out all our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And prepare us to come 
and to hear your voice and to know that you are with us this morning. In your, glory, in your glorious name's sake, Lord, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn to Exodus. We're looking at the gospel in Exodus. And we're in Exodus chapter 28. Exodus chapter 28. And my text is verse 1, just one verse. I'll read you the text. Now take Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. That's it. That's my text. Okay, so what have we been looking at? The gospel in Exodus. We've been looking particularly at the tabernacle. We've been looking particularly at the things related to the tabernacle. We saw the veil. We saw that curtain that separates us, the Holy of Holies. We saw the lamp last time, the light, which is a, all these things are symbols, pictures of Christ. And now we look at the priest. So our message this morning is this, the priest. And I want to give it two headings. First, we're going to look together at the Old Testament priest. Then we're going to look at the New Testament priest. That's it. That's where we're going. So again, it's another gospel picture and it's a real image of Jesus Christ, the type of picture of Christ himself. Aaron is told, Moses is told to take his brother and his sons and they were to be, make him a priest. So this is what we have in the verse. Make a priest, have a priest. Now what follows in this chapter, and we'll look at a few of these verses together, what follows is the details of that priesthood. So you have all the instructions, the clothes that he, he was to wear, the duties of the priest, all the, the rest of the book of Exodus is taken up now with this. And remember the purpose of the tabernacle. The purpose of the tabernacle was to meet with God. That's what we're saying. God would come down and meet with these people. Now, here is something else. God gives all these instructions to prepare the people to meet with God. Now, here's something else he's telling them they need for this to take place. What is it they need now? They need a priest. Now, here is a great deal about this in the Bible. There's too much for us to even look at this morning. But it, the priest essentially had a number of characteristics. First of all, of course, he was chosen by God. And then he was to perform these special duties of a priest. There's no time for us to look into them all. But essentially, I'll give you the big one. Essentially, the priest was to be a mediator. A mediator between God and the people. The one that comes in the middle. Remember, only the priest, you remember it, could enter the most holy place. And he could only do that once a year on behalf of the people. He would offer sacrifices regularly to God for his own sins, but particularly for the sins of the people. He would sprinkle blood on the altar. He would sprinkle it in the tabernacle. He would go into that holy place and sprinkle it on the mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant, that gold lid with the cherubim. And he alone could do that. No one else could do that. He's the only one that could go and stand in that holy place before God. And offer those sacrifice once a year, the daily sacrifice. He would do that. He would burn incense on the altar. And of course, we saw last time, it was his job to keep those light, that light burning, the lamp burning in the tabernacle. But ultimately, he was a mediator. A mediator is a go-between. One who acts on behalf of two parties. He represents them both, if you like. So here's the priest now. He's representing God. He's standing between God and the people. He goes in on behalf of the people, but he's also coming before God. So here he is between God and people. This is the role of a priest. That's how you should see him. One who stands in the middle. One who, in a sense, is telling us very clearly the people themselves cannot come directly to God. They can't. So the priest is instructed to come on their behalf. Only he can come. And if they're going to come, they can only come through a mediation. 
the mediatory role of the priest. That's the only way for them to come. So there's your Old Testament priest. He's standing between God and the people. Try and see him there. And he's there to offer sacrifice to God on behalf of the people. Now let's read a little. Look at Exodus 28. I want to read from verse 3. So you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom. And they shall make Aaron's garments to consecrate him that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which you ye shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, skillfully woven tunic, a turban, a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that they may minister to me as priests. Verse 5, they shall take gold, blue, purple, scarlet thread, fine linen. They shall make an ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread. Fine woven linen, artistically worked. It shall have two shoulder straps joined at its two edges, and so it shall be joined together. And the intricately woven band of the ephod, which is on it, shall be of the same workmanship. Can you see the detail here now? Made of gold and blue and purple scarlet thread and fine woven linen. Verse 9. Listen to verse 9. Then you shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Now let me read on. Go to verse 10. Six of the names on one stone, six of the names on the other stone. This is the, the ten tribes of Israel. In order of their birth, with the work of an engraver in the stone, like an engraver of a signet. And you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. And you shall set them in settings of gold. Can you see that? Verse 12. And you shall put the two stones on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel. So Aaron shall bear the names, their names before the Lord. Can you see this picture of this, this elaborate uh, costume, if you like, he's wearing with engraved names on the stones, on these shoulders, as a memorial, bringing them before the Lord. It's a marvelous thing. But let me move on. Let's go to verse 21. And the stones shall have the names of the sons of Israel, 12 according to their names, like the engraving of a signet, each one with its own name. They shall be according to the 12 tribes. Now, do you see the picture? The priest has got the names of the children of Israel and, and they're engraved on these stones. Now, I want you to notice now this next part of the uniform, verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment. Not only on these stones, but on this breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. You're to put this breastplate of judgment on him. Can you see it? He's literally carrying the names of the children of Israel upon his heart now. But notice it's, a, it's an incredible picture, a breastplate of judgment. Now let me move on. Look at verse 36. You shall make also a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. A plate of gold now with holiness to the Lord and you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban to be on the front of the turban so it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead and they may be accepted, they may be accepted before the Lord. Now what a picture that is. Can you try and imagine this guy in your imagination? He, he's got the names of, of, of the children of Israel, the people, on his heart, on a breastplate, but it's called the breastplate of judgment. He's got a turban and he's got a gold plate right on the top of it saying, Holiness to the Lord. So look at, carefully at him. Let's try and understand him. He's standing in the holy place. He comes into the presence of God, directly into the presence of God. There he is as a mediator between God and the people. And there he's offering sacrifices for their sins. 
And there he's also carrying their names, particularly not just on his shoulders, but on his heart. And it's there before God. And of course, he's bearing their names. This is significant on a breastplate that's called the breastplate of judgment. And he has this turban on his head. Can you see him with this turban on his head? And the words are engraved into the gold plate over his forehead. Holiness to the Lord. And this is the way he is to come. Look at him. Pay attention to him. He's going to come to God on behalf of these people. A God, the Bible says, who's holy. A God who is of purer eyes to behold iniquity. He can't even look on sin. He can't even look at it. Never mind, even caught with it. He will not look at it. A God we saw last week who dwells in unapproachable light. Who no man has seen or can see. Now I won't go over last week's message. A God who is so holy, so pure. Is, is the intensity of the light, of the glory of God, the purity. Now think of it. What do you think of all this? What do you think of all this Old Testament ritual? Is it all a lot of ridiculous nonsense to you? A lot of people would say that. What's he dressed up like that for? What's all this nonsense? Listen, this garment that this guy's wearing, his clothes, they are screaming at you today. They are shouting at you. If you'd only pay attention to his, his clothes and what he's wearing. What are they saying to me? They're saying, you cannot enter. You cannot come to God. That's what they're saying. They're screaming at you. Read the words on his forehead. See it and the dress and the way he comes to God. They are shouting, God is holy and you and I are not. You're not holy. God is separate from us. God is set apart. He is so pure, so holy, so clean. He is of such intense light, such absolute perfection, intense holiness, that these garments are teaching us what God is like. That's all God is telling us. The tabernacle, the holy of holies, the veil, the curtain, the cherubim, the altar, the whole light before it. And now this priest, he comes in wearing all this gear. It's saying to you, stop. Stop where you are. You cannot draw near. Do you remember Moses? You remember how we began this series? Stop, says God. He saw that burning bush. Don't you dare come near. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. This is God manifesting himself. And God is saying, stop. You cannot draw near. You cannot come to me. Do you get it? You can't. You cannot enter here. We saw it with the curtain. We've seen it with every aspect of the tabernacle. The Bible tells us our God is a consuming fire. The fire is a symbol of his purity and holiness. So it's ridiculous to speak of, I'm a good person, and I've not done anybody any harm, and I've done the best I can, and I'm sure God will accept me. And I know good people, and I know a lot of kind people, and I'm sure I will go to heaven. It is utterly ridiculous to talk that way. No, no. We saw with this tabernacle, when God actually comes down into it, they can't even come in. They can't even enter it. Such is the intensity. We saw Isaiah having a glimpse of that glory. What did he say? Woe is me. I'm dead. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. My eyes have had a glimpse of the glory. Daniel falls down dead. John falls down as a dead man. No strength left in him. The people who are with them, they, they scarp as fast as they can. Paul of the Damascus Road, they, they're terrified. Because of God's presence and God's glory. The Old Testament priest is telling us we can't enter heaven. It's screaming at us. It's shouting at us. We cannot come to God. We cannot. That's why you have to have a priest. Because they can't come. 
And do you remember, it's pointing forward. That's the point of the Old Testament. We're told, as long as this tabernacle stood, as long as there was this veil, this curtain, this altar, this priest, as long as this priest was standing there with all this gear on, the way into the most holy place was not yet revealed. It wasn't revealed. Now, thank God this morning that we can now come to the New Testament priest. Thank God we've got the gospel. We don't end there, do we? That is a truth that we must learn. But it's two parts of the Bible. Old Testament, New Testament. And the old is wonderful, but it's pointing forward. So look at the New Testament priest. Here he is. The Old Testament priest, we said, he's just a type. He's just a shadow. He's just a picture. He's, a, he's pointing forward to what? Who is this New Testament priest? Well, of course, we've read it in Hebrews. It's Jesus Christ. Our great high priest. That's his this title in the Bible. We got such a great high priest. He's so thrilled to tell us. Jesus is a priest. Jesus was chosen by God the Father. He was. Jesus is our mediator, the Bible says. Jesus offers one sacrifice for sins. Jesus carries the names of his people on his heart. He does. Oh, he loves them. He carries their names on a breastplate of judgment before God. He literally does. And he himself bears that title, holiness to the Lord. He is the very epitome of this priest. His priesthood, though, is greater than the Old Testament one. The Old Testament, we've said it again and again, the old priest is just a shadow. He's just a type. As long as he's ministered, the, the way into heaven has not yet been revealed. But now there's a greater one. Now there's one that's come to, to replace that one once and for all, to, to get rid of it and bring something greater. It was only ever meant to be a type of picture. Here is Jesus, the greater priest. He's got a greater priesthood. He is described, we read it in our reading, as one who has an unchangeable priesthood. It doesn't change. Let's go back to Hebrews 5. Look at the way he contrasts the old and the new. Every priest taken from among men is appointed by for men in the things pertaining to God, that they may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant, going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. He's just a man like everyone else. Because of this he is required, as for the people, so for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And look at this, and no man takes this honour upon himself. It's not anybody who can do this. He's got to be called by God, just as Aaron was. Look at now the new. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest. But it was he who said, Look at this now, you are my son, Psalm 2. Today I have begotten you. And he also said in another place, another psalm. Can you see it? You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Can you see the two things that the, the, Old Test the New Testament there is quoting the Old Testament psalm? Who, what's he saying about this priest? He's saying, I'll tell you this priest, he's, he's the son of God. I'll tell you who he is. He's a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. It's a difficult one, that. This is the guy that appears in the Old Testament to Abraham. He comes and he goes and we never see him again. And the whole thing about priesthood is that it was a family line, a family tree. You're, you are on your sons and on it went. And as they died, they were replaced. Hebrews tells us this. And then another one comes and another one. And they constantly are replaced. And they are all from one tribe. Only from that one tribe, tribe of Levi, not from any other tribe. Jesus isn't from the tribe of Levi. This is the question Hebrews takes up. He's from the tribe of Judah. And there's nothing in the Bible about a priest from there. Ah, because he's of a different order. He's of Melchizedek. What does that mean? It means he's like him. He's a type. This guy comes. There was none before him and there's none after him. He's a picture of Jesus. The Son of God, who is a greater priest, none before him, 
None after him. He doesn't have a genie. He doesn't need. No one's going to follow him, you see. There isn't going to come anybody after him. He's not like that Old Testament priest in, in, in here in Exodus, in Aaron, the Levites. No, no. He's of a different priesthood. Now look what he says in chapter 7. Look at verse 21. Oh, I love it. He says, The Lord has sworn... Well, let me read from verse 20. As much as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath. God swore it. But he's also sworn... Now he quotes the psalm again. The Lord has sworn he will not relent. You are a priest forever. This is a prophetic word for Christ. According to the order of Melchizedek. So by so much more, Jesus has become surety, promise of a better covenant. Why is it better? Because there were many priests who were prevented by death from continuing. They died. That's why they had so many. But he, because he continues forever, he lives to never die. He's never going to die, Jesus. He died and he rose again. Therefore, look at this. Therefore, listen to this. He becomes, he continues forever and he has an unchangeable priesthood. Can you see the language? It doesn't change. He's a priest forever. No one's coming after him. He's a priest now, and he's a priest forever. Can you see the greater now? There's this Old Testament priest. He just lasts as long as he lives. And then another one comes, and another one, and another one. Jesus has come. He's the final one. He's replaced all them. And he's is forever. He's a priest forever. Nobody's coming after him. And you don't, you'll see why. We don't need another one. He, listen to what he says. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. What about this? Since he always lives to make intercession for them. What a, for such a high priest. He's our priest. This is Jesus who is holy, armless, undefiled, separate from sinners. He is holiness to the Lord personified in his body. He is God manifest in a human body. He is God here on earth. But he's a priest. We know Jesus is a king. We know Jesus is a prophet. We must, we're learning this morning that Jesus is a priest. Our greatest priest. The great high priest. Oh, such a priest for us. Can you see? He's there for us. Not for himself, for us. Why did God become a man? For us. Why did he come to earth? For us. Why did he become a priest? For doing the job of a priest. To represent us before God. To be the mediator. But the supreme mediator. Look at Hebrews again. The Old Testament priest, he said, well, he offers sacrifices. He did offer those sacrifices. But listen to the Hebrews 9 and verse 22. I love the contrast. He says, according to the law, most things are purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that copies of the things in heaven should be purified. Purified with these things. But they're only copies. But they should have better sacrifices than these. God had provided a better sacrifice than these. For Christ has not entered holy places made with hands, which are only copies of the truth. See, he's always talking about this true tabernacle. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about not a holy of holies behind a curtain. He's talking about heaven. He says, they're only copies of the true, but into heaven itself. Where's he come? Into the holies behind the curtain? No, no. Heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. How about this? Can you see the greater priest now? This is this Old Testament priest going into these sh- types and shadows, this holy place on earth, a tabernacle made with hands. This is Jesus. He's coming into heaven. Into heaven itself. Into the most holy place. And Look at the way he comes. I think it's just staggering. He's entered for us, he says. He's entered for us. Let me read it in chapter 10 and verse 11. Look what he says in chapter 10 and verse 11. Oh, I love it. He says, Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man. Can you see the but there? But this man. This, he's a man, you see. He has to be a man to be a priest. Because he has to be sympathetic to the sins of people. Just like us. Tempted like us. Chosen from amongst men, this priest. 
Jesus was a man. Listen to him. Oh, listen. But this man, oh, what a different man this is. This man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Isn't that wonderful? There's this priest offering daily sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man offers one sacrifice for sins forever. One sacrifice for sins forever. And then he sits down in the right majesty of heaven at the right hand of God. He goes, for by one offering is perfected forever all who are being sanctified. He's perfected them. What a statement this is. It's quite insane. It's absolutely insane. Look into verse 19. How many times I've read this in this series? We've got to read it again now. Therefore, brethren, therefore, if this is so, if we have such a priest like this, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he consecrated through, and we saw this when we looked at the veil, through the veil that is his flesh, and having a, now we're looking at the priest, having a high priest over the house of God. We've got this high priest now. Come on, now let's draw near with a true heart in full assurance of fear. Two things he's saying there, really. He's saying, if you really believe that we have a priest like this, you should be, you should be confident to come to God. You should know that you can come confidently. You should come with, with full assurance. Well, will he accept me? How many Christians, even Christians, lack assurance? Will I go to heaven? Will, he, will I be there? I hope I am. You, that's not Christianity. No, no, you need to know full assurance of faith. And if you've never come to Christ, you need to know that Christ will receive you. You need to know that 100% guaranteed this great priest will receive you today, right now. You can come confidently. You can come with a full assurance of faith. You've got to believe, though. What have I got to do to get to heaven? You've got to believe. You've got to believe that you can come to this priest. You've got to believe that you can come to this Jesus. You've got to believe it. Oh, listen. So let's do that, he says. Let's come. Let's draw near with a full assurance. And look at this. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. And let's not lose, ever lose sight of this gospel that he has done for us. You see, Jesus, the greater high priest, He's the Holy Son of God. He's, he's the priest forever. It's, everything's greater, you see. He's not entered a tabernacle made with hands. He's not entered a holy of holies that, that is just a symbol of the true. He himself, we saw, is the veil. He's not entered an earthly tabernacle. No, he's entered heaven. Heaven itself. And he's not entered with the blood of animals. He's entered with his own blood. He sacrificed himself. He's not only the priest, he's the sacrifice. And he's done something that's unspeakably unbelievable. He's offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Not only is he a priest forever, he has offered a sacrifice that is good forever. Forever. Why did they have to keep repeating those sacrifices because they could never take away sins you don't have to repeat this one because it takes away sins and by the way it takes them away forever forever what did Jesus cry on the cross it is finished what have I got to do is there something more to do it is finished the Greek word tetelestai paid in full I've done it He's paid. He's offered one sacrifice for sins forever. And we saw it with the veil. We've seen it through this tabernacle series. We've seen heaven is now open for all. In the context of what we're looking at this morning, the Old Testament priesthood is fulfilled. It's now fulfilled. The New Testament priesthood has come. The Old Testament priesthood is finished. Finished. It's over. So listen, if you meet a minister who calls himself a priest, I'm telling you to do this. I'm telling you now. You can quote me if you want, but you should say it. From the Bible, it's nothing to do with me. You should tell him these words. Tell him he's been sacked. 
Tell him he's been made redundant by God. That God doesn't need him anymore. That he's out of work. That he's unemployed. And they're not joking. You are redundant. You can tell him that. Why? Because we don't need a priest anymore. We have one great high priest who fulfills it all. One mediator. One go-between between God and men. And that's the theme of Hebrews. And that's the whole point of Hebrews and what Hebrews 8 is saying. Now, this is the main point. This is the main point of Exodus. This is the main point of this tabernacle. This is the main point of this priesthood. We've got such a high priest. We've got one. And his name is Jesus, the Son of God, seated at the right hand of glory. Paul, writing to Timothy, he says it like this. There is one God. And there's one mediator. What about other religions? People say that, don't they? What about other religions? What about, there are other ways to God. This is what the Bible says. Let them bring their religions, but let us bring ours. Here's what Christianity says. There is one God, two, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 3. Listen to this, uh, verse 5. There is one God and one mediator. One, notice the word one. One God and one mediator. Between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Can you see the Bible shouting at you that there is no other way to come to God except through Jesus Christ? Jesus is the only mediator. Jesus is the only priest between God and men. He's the one the Bible screams at us and says, he's the only one that can bring us to God. He's the only one that can stand before God on our behalf. There's no one else. Look at this Old Testament priest. The people, I've told you again and again, the people could not come. That's the message. They needed a priest. They could not come to God without the priest. They were not allowed to come. Now look at the New Testament priest. You can come now. This is the message. You can come now. But you come there's hope now, you see. There's no hope in the old, there's hope in the new. The hope in the old is just pointing forward to the new. It's looking forward. Abraham looked forward. Moses looked forward. God has now come. And you can come to God, and really the same message, if you look at it the other way around, God, the, it's the same message really, just from the new. You may say it's positive, well, it's negative as well. You can only come to God through this priest. Here's your Old Testament. You can't come to God without the priest. There's your New Testament. You can't come to God without a priest. But the priest is Jesus. The great high priest. He's the way. Jesus says, I am the way. And there is no other way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can come to God except through me. I'm the only mediator between God and man. I'm the only one that takes hold of the hand of God and takes hold of the hand of a sinner and brings you to God. No one else can bring you to God. Your Old Testament priest couldn't do that. I can do it. He's the only one. He's the only mediator. He's the only name given whereby we must be saved. He alone, the Bible says, is able to save to the uttermost. Can you see it? All who come to God through him. But you've got to come through him. Look at your great high priest. I want to quote a couple of hymns to finish. My time is gone. But listen, listen to these hymns carefully. I wonder if you can see him. So we're not looking at the Old Testament priest now. We're looking at the New Testament one. Forget the old. We've had a look at him. We, we've learned about him. But let's look at Jesus. What is he wearing? What does he look like? I want you to see him. I want you to imagine him. We mentioned it last week. Where is he? He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's being pressed in the olive press. You remember it? He's being crushed. Crushed. Under the weight of our sin. Listen to the hymn writer. What's he doing in that garden? He's our great high priest. He's representing us before God. He's making intercession. We'll look at intercession. Listen to this. Great high priest, we view thee stooping with our names upon your breast. In the garden, groaning, drooping, to the ground with horrors pressed. All the angels stood confounded. 
to see the maker thus. Listen to this. And can we? There's the question today. The question of questions. God is speaking to you right now. And can we? Let me put it more personal. And can you remain unmoved when you know it was all for you? There he is. Sweating drops of blood, pressed under the weight, carrying the sh on his shoulders and on his breast the judgment and the weight of God's judgment, even in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you see him there. He's on the ground. Hasn't even gone to the cross yet. Hasn't even been nailed to the cross. And he says, can you remain unmoved when you know he did all this for you? It's a staggering, staggering great high priest. But let's follow him further. See him going to Calvary. See him laying down his life on that cross for us. And we know our gospel, we should know it. What's he doing? I'll tell you what he's doing. He's carrying our names upon his breast. On that cross. He's making intercession, and we'll come back and look at that. But, oh, friends, look at him. Look what the hymn writer says now. Oh, listen, he says, he says, an incredible thing. I just find these lines just, my name from the palm of his hands, eternity. Why does he mention palm of his hands? Because they're nailed to the cross. Eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it remains. In marks of indelible grace. He's carrying our names there before God and bearing the judgment. The Old Testament priest is just a picture of Christ. And he's there doing it. He said it himself. He's laying down his life for us. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Paul says, you know what Jesus did? My great high priest, he loved me. And he gave himself for me. This is how you come to the cross. He loved me. He carried our names there on that cross, on his heart. And he bore them in judgment before God. Oh, bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place condemned he stood. Sealed my pardon. Why is he standing before God? What's he bearing? My judgment. Sealed my pardon with his blood. He's offering himself as a sacrifice. Hallelujah. What a saviour. What a great high priest. What a saviour Jesus is. And this is the main point. The gospel is telling you again and again. This is the main point he keeps driving home. We've got such a saviour. We've got such a high priest. We have one, you see, who's in heaven now, who's at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. He lives to make intercession. He's the one who we can go to directly to heaven. Before the throne of God above, a great high priest I have there, whose name is love. He's there right now. I want to tell you, did you know, you must know this, that you can go to Jesus right now, right at this very second, this moment. I was brought up, many of you know, in the Roman Catholic Church. And I was brought up to do something I didn't like doing. I mean, I didn't. As a kid, I hated it. But I had to go, my parents made me go. And I would be asked this question if I hadn't been. Have you been to confession? It was on a Saturday morning. And I would do anything to get out of going to this. And you'd sit in this church and there would all be these rooms along the side of the church, little booths. And you went in and there was a screen. And behind that screen was a priest. And you'd go in and confess your sins to a priest because he was the mediator between you and God. You couldn't go directly to God. You had to go to this priest and you had to confess your sins to him. And I used to, couldn't even remember the sins. I just to make a few up. What was going to say? I, I, what have you done, son? And I'd be like, mm, yeah. Water a few down, make a few up, not tell him everything. But I would confess my so-called sins. And then he would pronounce the forgiveness of my sins and tell me to do this various penance I had to do for even more forgiveness. 
Listen, let me tell you about this. And I'd be asked, have I been to confession? Sometimes I hadn't been and I'd lie and say, I've been, but I hadn't. You know, let me tell you, you can go now directly to Jesus. You don't need these booths. You don't need those men behind the screen. They're all finished. You can go direct to heaven to Jesus and he and he alone can forgive your sin. It's actually blasphemy. I saw it when I was converted for them to pronounce forgiveness of sin. Do you remember Jesus did that? Do you remember it? And the high priest called him a blasphemer. The the Pharisees called him a blasphemer. Who can forgive sins? Only God can forgive sin. What a twist of the scriptures. So you go directly to Jesus and he and he alone can forgive your sins. We've got such a high priest who can do it. There's only one. His name is Jesus. And so my question to you, the Lord wants me to ask you this morning, is simple. Have you been to confession? Have you been to confession? I'm asking you for the first time, have you ever been to confession? Have you ever been to Jesus to confess your sins? He's here today. You must do it today. You must come to confession today. Not telling you to go home and go to conf- go come to him now and confess your sins. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord and calls upon him as a sinner will be saved. But I'm talking to you as believers as well. Have you been to confession today? You need to go every day and confess your sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're such sinners, even as Christians, we need to go to him every day. Every day. Listen. He's waiting. Right now, he's waiting to hear your confession. He's inviting you, the great high priest, to come to him. He's never turned anyone away. And he, when you come, will pardon all your sins. You will have found he has brought you to God. He has literally done it. Because he's borne your sin himself. The moment you come, the moment you come to Jesus for the first time, you'll be able to do something that only he can do. Only he can do. You will now be able to do what he can do. You'll be able to enter the most holy place. You'll be able to do that. Heaven. Now, in this life, and when you die. Peter said you are now a royal priesthood. Once you were not a people, now you're the people of God. Once you were not saved, now you're saved. Now you are a royal priesthood, a holy people. Once you were not God's people, now you're his people. John says this, he has washed us from our sins in his own blood and he's made us kings and priests to God. Us. And we can come in. No wonder he says, to him be the glory forever and ever. Isn't it marvelous this morning to be able to say in this church, we've got such a great high priest. What a wonderful priest. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we have such a great high priest whose name is love. Who's got an unchangeable priest. One who fulfills all the Old Testament types and figures and pictures. And now he's the one who only you can bring us to heaven, bring us to God. And we can come boldly and confidently to him. Lord, we thank you. You're there for us right now. And we can come to you today. And may we come to you today, even before we leave this building, even as we sing this hymn, may we call upon you. And may you hear our confession and our prayer. Lord, if we confess our sins, you and you alone can forgive our sins not only pardon all those sins, but make us priests and bring us into the very throne room of heaven yourself. Blessed be your name. Amen. Amen. Let's close with before the throne of God above. Amen.
Thank you.